what happened in the first half is we tried to understand features of um, expectations in the data and uh, some ways uh, of modeling and describing uh, the systematic biases that we often see in the data. The second part, I want to transition to thinking about how expectations data help us un understand behavior and how those biases that we have detected may have uh, various types of consequences. And for evaluating the consequences, it's really an, an area with a lot of open questions and uh, scope for research. So um, if you're interested, there's a lot more work to do. So first, let's start with thinking about the, inf the informative of expectations and um, how we use this to understand behavior, which uh, Jose pointed out at the beginning. So expectations in the data, um, research so far have found them to indeed have pretty significant explanatory power for behavior. For example, studying stock rich, uh, how people allocate their portfolios, um, and also, for example, how firms invest. And this can, uh, you can use expectations data to explain both aggregate dynamics and uh, what f uh, each firm individual um, does. And uh, so let's see some examples. This is back to Alhana's question of portfolio allocation. So if you look at an indication of how people allocate their, uh, their money, uh, one indication is mutual fund flow. So how much more money you want to put in stock mutual funds um, uh, f of course, the managers may take over the money and manage for, the, for you, but you need to make the first step decision of whether to put your money in a mutual fund to begin with. And y you can see um, this co-moves very strongly with people's sentiment about the stock market. When people are optimistic about the stock market, they put a lot out of money into equity mutual funds. When they're pessimistic, they take money out. And there's uh, another interesting recent paper um, by Stefano Giglio, Matteo Maggiore, and Johanna Strobel, where they tracked Vanguard investors um, for the past two and a half years. So they were sending emails to these Vanguard invest to Vanguard investors on a monthly basis to ask about their expectations of the stock market. So these are numerical questions, um, and they look at how people invest um, in stocks. And they find that people who um, expect higher returns at a given point in time are more likely to have a larger share of their portfolios, at least their Vanguard portfolios in equity. Yes? Yeah, so uh, that is a frequently asked question. I have never Sorry, walked. What, what was the question? The question what is why, oh, yes. why <laughs> these people <laughs> invest 50% in, in stocks while expecting things to drop by by 20 percent. I uh, don't know. Uh, actually, that brings another thing, because the paper actually points out that people act on their expectations yes. for sure, yeah. but they're kind of sluggish. Yeah, that's the, the next, yeah. Really think yeah. About it. And those it are people very well invested. I mean, uh, it's a very biased sample. Those are people that already invested in no, the market. No, I understand it's a biased sample. That's not a, but the no, question is that it, it, you look at changes of their, of their <coughs> portfolio, so how much more they invest and so on. This is what uh, the equity shares vary. But so, yeah. So this is across all the Vanguard allocations. And note that some of them are like defined contribution pension plans that people may not change very frequently, um, or they may not be able to change. Like they may only be able to change allocations once a year or something like that. Um, so in terms of the mechanics of the data collection, this is the monthly survey. This is administrative data. This is not reported. It's it's they they they're in in collaboration with a, a Vanguard person, and so this is from administrative data. And so it, it could be that these person these people have not had a chance to rebalance. Maybe after they answered the survey and they said they the negative twenty percent and forecast and very much. So there's yeah. an average return, but they yeah. could be so much higher. So let's see if I have it. Uh, uh, yeah. So so for example, they so save that for one slide and let me yeah. take the other questions. I don't know how the quest the question and questions are designed, but couldn't the equity share means uh, short positions also? I don't think Vanguard allows you to they take short like positions. And so, so the yeah. Have a and plus, because this administrative data, like even if you have one dollar in Vanguard, uh, 
50, like, so these people maybe only have one dollar in, in Vanguard and then 50% the of it is in stocks. They, they don't know the allocation outside of Vanguard. So it is possible that these folks have a lot of money in the banks and a little money in Vanguard and that's the default in Vanguard. So that's another margin of adjustment that's not captured by this data. Um, was there another question at the back? So um, yes, we're even like in inflation forecast data like Michigan, in particular, the household surveys, you, you may see some people who expect inflation to be 20% and you can take them out. Uh, even if you take out people with extreme beliefs, the, this pattern still stands. However, it's true, um, and that's and the second point I want to mention, is that people do not act on their beliefs um, with the equal uh, level of aggressiveness. So for example, they start by looking at different types of allocations, for example, the pension plans, which is hard to adjust, versus retail accounts. Uh, and you see the sensitivity of equity allocation to expectations is lower for the types of accounts where it's harder to adjust. You can also um, look at how, like, the correlation with how much people trade. Of course, if you don't trade, and you cannot adjust anything. For people who trade a lot, the sensitivity from belief to equity share is higher. Um, and th then you can look at their confidence, uh, or, or the number of Vanguard visits. Similarly, it's an approximation to how much you trade. You can look at their confidence. People who, these people may not be very confident. They may think there is some chance uh, of a crash, but the distribution is very wide. Um, so people with low confidence act on the average beliefs less, and people with high confidence act more aggressively. You ask um, them questions about how confident they are? This is a, so I think they do, this, this set of authors, they do ask about confidence. They may also ask about the confidence intervals, but that I don't remember. I think they, they asked about scenario forecasts, like, and then you can also measure the belief as the average of the scenario forecasts. Um, so the general lesson is um, the translation from beliefs to actions um, is somewhat context dependent. It depends on certain types of um, features, for example, how much friction or cost there is to act on your beliefs and how um, strongly you feel about the beliefs. And then when you look at, for example, um, in the context of firm's investment, you also see that um, expectations of future earnings growth is a pretty strong predictor of how um, firms invest. Um, this holds in the aggregate, the, the time series wise, as well as the, at the firm level. And uh, in terms of predictive power, uh, the, the predictive power of expectations is pretty strong, even controlling for traditional forecasts, like uh, sorry, traditional predictor variables like Q or um, financial market um, conditions. So then, um, Another aspect to see the usefulness of survey expectations is to see that it helps you to not just predict behavior, but also interpret behavior of what generates types of uh, some phenomenon that we observe. For example, if we, of course, we see a lot of fluctuations in asset prices in financial markets, and then what is the underlying driver of these fluctuations? Um, the, the data on beliefs can help us understand some of these mechanisms. So I want to start by saying if we, um, in, in basic um, finance 101, we learn uh, some basic objects for thinking about um, evaluation. The first one is discount rate. Discount rate is how much you think um, a dollar uh, is worth tomorrow relative to today for a, the risk that you are taking. And then there is also the statistical expected returns of investing in something and then the subjective expectations of returns. And in a rational world, in the frictionless world, then these three things are roughly the same. So if you, uh, your discount rate is 5%, you discount dividends in the future by 5%. And so you would also, ex in expectation, either subjectively and objectively, price appreciation would be 5% because you've discounted the future by 5%. However, when you do have biased expectations, 
then these three objects can be quite different. For example, even if people have constant uh, discount rates, the, the expected returns can fluctuate over time. I just want to show this like in a super simple um, setting, um, the simplest uh, one where you can have two types of people. And so I'm not going to do SDF um, to save the trouble, and I will just assume simple uh, mean variance demand. So what's the setup? So suppose you have an asset in unit supply, and there are two dates. Uh, the risk-free rate is RF. The asset pays a dividend at uh, date one, and then the world ends thereafter with an expectation D bar. And um, investors, importantly, have just constant discount rate. Um, and half of the investors have bias expectations. They, they think that the dividend will be higher than the true statistical distribution by a factor, uh, by, by an amount S, and that's like short for sentiment. And half of the people are, are rational. And then for any given price, you can it's the constant yeah. or it's a line of variable? So w which one? A S S let's say it's, it's, it's just a constant. And it's positive or? Uh, well, for simplicity, let's say it's positive. It doesn't really matter. The negative case is just works the, the, the other way. So l l for simplicity, let's say it's a positive thing. It's a positive constant. And so for any uh, given level of P uh, current price, well, which we'll so for, um, for any given level of P, of course, the ones who are, have bias expectations, suppose they are, the, they are overly optimistic, they would think that the, the, according to their subjective expectation, the return will be higher. So D tilde should be D bar plus S, correct? Oh, That's D tilde, no, no, it, no. So it's for, it's, it's a just, it, D is a random variable. So for okay, each so possible realization, so you, you increase you it by S. S. Yeah, you so add it by S. Yeah, so the okay. expectation okay. is d bar plus s. So therefore, you see that the, uh, ex the, the subjective expectations return is d bar plus s divided by um, same. And, uh, and let's just assume that people have mean variance demand, so everything is super simple. Um, in this case, you will see that the um, date zero price, of course, is increasing in s and um, weighted by the fraction of people who hold these um, bias beliefs. So if we, as econometrician, we observe the price, but suppose we don't have information about the subjective beliefs, we only can, we, we can use our statistical tools to, have a, to arrive at the statistical estimation of the distribution of D, then without expectations data when the price is high, then of course we'll attribute it to uh, a lower discount rate or lower degree of risk aversion, and there's a large literature in trying to fit time variations in returns and in prices based on um, time-varying risk aversion. However, if you do have expectations data, then of course you don't have to change the preferences to fit the P because I've specified the data generating process as constant preferences. And in this case, you will see that the expectations of returns and discount rates would decouple so the discount rate is always constant. The expected return is low when S is high because price is inflated when S is high. Um, so you would have very, you can have variations in expected returns that doesn't really reflect changes in discount rates. And also if you collect data on expectations of returns for expectations of cash flows in this world, if you sample the people who are biased, uh, suppose households are more likely to be biased, if you sample those biased people, then when the sentiment is high, subjective expectations of returns would be high. But if you have an equally weighted sample of everyone, then the subjective expectations of returns would, is not a function of S. So when you interpret, for example, survey data on subjective expectations of returns, again, this doesn't have to reflect variations in discount rates. When people ex subjectively think that stock market um, goes up, it doesn't necessarily reflect that they have a higher discount rate, which is actually a confusion that um, people sometimes make, uh, which is when you see these survey data on expectations of returns, some people would interpret it that they imply time variations in discount, which, would, which doesn't have to be the case. So the, the morale of this very simple exercise is just to say that when you have subjective beliefs, um, discount, uh, discount rates um, and, and expected returns and subjective expectations returns can be different objects. 
Th there's also another uh, point I want to make, which is in this world, if you have a, a equally weighted representative sample of everyone, you don't get very, you don't get the even the subjective expectations of returns to be a function of s. The intuition is very simple. When the sentiment is high, then price is already high. Then some people would have realized that the expected returns would be low. Uh, this is like with two types of people. If you have a representative agent, even if the representative agent holds bias belief, um, then in that case, the representative agent with bias belief doesn't necessarily need to think that return needs to be high when they expect high cash flows because they just discount it and it, then the expected returns would just be the discount rate. So it just means that to generate extrapolations in returns is a much more tricky business because if everyone extrapolated returns and you realize that everyone extrapolated returns, you would know that the price is high today already and therefore the return going forward should not be very high. So ex extrapolation of returns is much uh, more complicated than a world where you extrapolate cash flows. Um, well, you can ask why do we consider beliefs not simply preferences, as we already covered in the first half. One uh, reason is the data shows that biases and beliefs, but also um, with just simply tweaking preferences and modeling it as if, modeling distorted beliefs as if non standard preferences may not may miss some things. For example, um, in the data we often see statistically predictably negative access returns and some form of predictability of crisis which is uh, in, in many ways large negative returns um, that some people would say instability from beliefs. If, it's, if fluctuations in asset prices are just coming from fluctuations in preferences then it would be very hard to get predictable large uh, negative access returns. And for example, in the context of things like credit cycles, if the um, credit booms and the, the large booms in lending are just coming from lenders being less risk averse, and but they fully anticipate the risk, then you would think then, then there's no neglected risk, and you would think that they should set higher uh, loan loss provisions, and um, therefore some of the amplifications in a crisis, people get caught uh, and prepared would not happen. So then let me um, uh, transition to um, the question that people asked uh, in the first half, then how do you evaluate uh, the extent to which these biased beliefs um, affect actions? So if you just do the reduced form analysis, then you reliably get the, two, the following two features. One is expectations in the data affect decisions, as we just saw. Um, second is the expectations are imperfectly rational. However, with these reduced form estimates, uh, it's not very obvious to know what's the impact of the bias component of expectations. You can see the total impact of expectations, but it's not directly obvious what's the bias component of expectations. And in fact, if you do um, analysis like uh, predictable forecast errors, um, predicting forecast errors with some object, the same coefficient can be generated by different degrees of bias coupled with different features of the environment. So for example, um, oftentimes if you predict forecast errors, if you are running that regression in an environment where the underlying process is, is more persistent versus less persistent, more volatile versus less volatile, they can affect the regression coefficient for the same level of the bias parameter. So interpreting the, the backing out the degree of bias from reduced form coefficient without a model is um, often difficult. However, when you start imposing a model structure on it, then you lose some of the uh, model-free benefits of it. And as I will show through an example, um, the, the, the consequences are dependent on how you think about the modeling environment. So often what people would proceed in this case is a structural estimation and it's the general format of doing structural estimation. So you first have a model uh, that specifies a functional form of the bias as a, and, and the parameters that govern the degree of the bias. And then you derive some of the uh, key moments based on the model. 
and then you s uh, select these uh, key moments and try to match the moments in the data that will uh, allow you to back out the value of underlying parameters. And then once you have estimated the value of the underlying uh, parameters, you can evaluate the consequences in the setting of the model. So in a, a very recent work in progress with uh, uh, Tasman Suara and Tiziano Ropelli from the Bank of Italy, we do a very simple exercise to try to understand in what type of settings you would have more consequences from the bias. Of course, you may not have, you don't have to buy everything of the model, but the model will be helpful for helping us understand under what settings the same degree of bias would translate into more impact. So, so, so let's just uh, have a very simple setup where output is produced uh, um, in, in, in a, a cop Douglas way at the individual firm level with a productivity uh, that's A times E to the mu um, IT. And there's one period time to build. Uh, labor is flexibly selected every period, but capital needs to be uh, selected uh, one period in advance, and therefore you need to forecast future uh, productivity when you decide on the, the level of investment. Um, and there's a final good um, production that's aggregated firm level thing. This thing exists just because we want to analyze, for example, TFP losses in the aggregate, and therefore the dispersion and the aggregation matters. Um, so the firm level a log TFP process, suppose it follows this following process. So there's an underlying um, uh, the R1-ish component plus two other components. One is just a simple shock that's ID over time. And the other is uh, some private information that we may not observe, but firms may be able to observe of their future productivity. And suppose, let's uh, s say that biases can exist in, in the following form which is your subject subjective um, expectation of future productivity is this rational component plus two possible form of distortions. One is you may over or underreact to your to the firm's private information. And then you can also over or underreact to the IED shock that happens, the IED productivity shock that happens each period. And um, so here we, for example, take the functional form a la um, diagnostic expectations you just saw, which is most of the um, distortions is about the most recent shock. Suppose we model distortions and beliefs this way. And then, if, yeah. Can you, you make no assumptions about the private component, right? Yeah, we make no, well, yeah. Some realization. yeah, yes. And what you're saying it's not observable. Yeah, it's not observable. Not, not yeah. for you, but for yeah. the firm. For, for the firm, it's observable, yeah. And what the firm does is that it just thinks instead of what they observe psi, it's really one plus lambda psi. Yeah. So what's the difference between that and thinking? I, I don't know, such as we don't observe what they observe. Mm -hmm. Could you just make that one plus lambda psi, the new psi? You mean What's like different? why you need to separate these two components? Is Not these two components. I'm talking about why you have separate the rational expectation of size. Oh, no, no, it's the, you, you don't you have to separate it. It's just for illustration. That's and that's what the firm observes. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it doesn't make any yeah, real impact of this, okay. yeah. Uh, this is just a representation. This is the rational component. These are the biases, yeah. but you can combine them. But the bias, you can't really figure out. Yeah, no yeah. Yeah, and and again uh, here we assume, uh, um, as in what you saw previously, that there is no overconfidence. So you can imagine that adding overconfidence that you will see in the formula, adding overconfidence would affect how much the distortion would be. But let's for now suppose there is no um, overconfidence, and it's often convenient to have to characterize the full subjective distribution. And that's why um, diagnostic expectations is also more uh, convenient in many cases than some ad hoc rules of biases in the uh, average forecast. And therefore, in this context, we need to estimate six parameters of the model. Um, one is the persistence of the TFP, and then the variance of both the true surprise and the variance of the private information. 
and then the degree of uh, over and under reaction to the, the surprise and uh, the private information. And then finally, we allow, just for generality, the possibility that there is some measurement error in the forecast that firms make. Um, this is just to, as a, an ingredient for robustness, but it's not uh, essential to the economic content. So in this world, then once you've estimated the parameter, you can do the counterfactual of uh, what, for example, TFP would be if you don't have the, um, the biases, so you set the bias parameters to zero relative to what the TFP uh, would be with the estimated level of these biases. So after some s derivations, you would see that, well, wh where does TIP loss comes from? It's like in the CN Clino sense, TIP loss comes from dispersions across firms that are not justified by variations in their productivity. So it would take the following form, um, and these are just like some, some constant once you've pinned down the, um, the curvature of the product function and so on. So, so this is not super interesting. What, uh, W the part of the loss is driven by biases are the following, which is you have these two bias parameters um, squared because essentially whether it's positive or negative, it has the same impact because the dispersion in, uh, in, in across firms that matters. And then um, a, the persistence matters. If the process is more persistent, then these biases carry over more and then the volatility mat matters a lot actually. So in, if you have a more volatile environment because we have specified the um, biases to be based on these shocks, if you have more um, volatile environments and for a given level of uh, bias then there's a lot more scope for being wrong. Whereas if you have no news, again, as in diagnostic expectations you saw, if you have no news, there's nothing to respond to, there's nothing that you can get wrong. And if you estimate the model um, in the US data, which is, uh, as I will discuss later, where the data comes from, which is a uh, firm's forecast in the US, mostly pretty large firms, versus in Italian data, this is a survey um, run by the Bank of Italy since early 2000s, where they ask firms to forecast their future sales. If you do the same estimation procedure in the US data and in the Italian data, you will end up getting pretty different numbers. Um, so in, in the Italian data, you get much larger impact than in the U.S. data. And why? Um, in part because in, in the Italian firms, the TFP processes turn out to be much more volatile. And therefore, in this model, that will give you a much larger um, scope for getting things wrong and much larger impact. And also, if you just do reduced form tests of predicting forecast errors, in the US data and Italian data, you get this pretty similar reduced form estimates, but those reduced form estimates end up translating into different levels of, well, larger um, amount of bias in the Italian data. And the reason is, the again, the Italian data have much more spread out um, forecast uh, um, errors and larger volatility. and. So as I mentioned before, the level of persistence, the level of volatility can affect these reduced form um, forecasting, forecast error uh, coefficients. So if you just read the reduced form coefficient, um, it may not be fully pin down the degree of bias. Okay. And there, so yeah. Uh, what exactly is 0.3 to 5 percent? Uh, it's it's 0.3 percent, yes? Yes, right. So it's not very large. Now, what is it exactly? Can you explain to me what's delta of log TFP? So th it's just the delta of log TFP is what we observe in the data based on the estimated degree of bias relative to a counterfactual where you set the bias parameter to zero and you preserve the so other when characteristics. Gamma and when lambda and rho are zero, that's a rational expectation model. Yes. But you still, but this is a stochastic model. So there is, so. So, what are you measuring? I'm still I'm, I'm confused here. I'm sorry. So, so you the rational model yeah. that should come up is zero, right? The uh, well, if everybody was the TFP loss that should, that should yeah. be zero because yeah. if lambda and gamma are zero, yeah. that expression <coughs> becomes zero. Right. So what is zero in the rational model, and what is this zero point three percent? Right? Okay, can I? 
Oh, so the, what this formula is, is the difference between um, the, the TFP for a given level of distortion relative to no distortion. And of course, there will be zero if there's no distortion. So it's just a difference so you're of log 2p. Yeah. The difference between the two exercises, yeah. one with lambda uh, and gamma equals zero, right. and the other with some unknown gamma and lambda that you're trying to estimate. No, no, relative to a benchmark where gamma, uh, gamma and lambda is equal to zero. zero. So the difference between um, what the data would imply for a given level of these parameters relative to, okay. yeah. Is there a way to understand this 0.3% in real terms? What is 0.3%? So, so yeah, thing. relative to, like, so relative to a um, level with no frictions, you lose 0.3% of TFP with the measured level of distortion. So you, you lose on average 0.3% of TFP. So the point of TFP or percentage of TFP? 0.3% Percent of, 0.3% of TFP. So, so it's like, yeah, it's like 0.3% of GDP, like in the same vein. 0.3% of TFP. So it's not a huge number. Um, it's, it's not tiny, but it's also not a, a huge number. And you can ask why uh, it's not a huge number. It's not a huge number in part because these volatilities um, are not super large. The gamma and lambda estimate, I, I sorry, I don't have those on the slides, but uh, on the level um, like around 0.3 or 0.5, and you may remember that the theta, which is the same thing in different notation, is around 0.9 or uh, 1. But in the model, you yeah. use TFP because you have bad allocation of capital, Right. right? Yes, that's yeah. Makes you lose yeah. TFP. yeah. So, so you over in some firms over-invest, so so other firms under-invest, yeah. Less productive, relatively less so that's a loss in the TFP yeah. will be very high, right. and they invest too much. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other firms invest too little. Right. And if you could just get them to invest according to the rational forecast, yes. which is the one that comes yeah. from equal to gamma equal yeah. zero, you get a, a growth in, in GDP, you get a growth in TFP. Right. I'm not really sure about the units yet because I understand TFP multiplies the capital and labor. Mm -hmm. And so I assume. Oh yeah, this is not loss in output. Uh, there's another formula for the loss yeah, in output, right? right the yes. Output would be different because the yeah. Would be in the different yeah. Yeah. So, so this I is mean, loss in loss of TFP. How to measure it? But that's, that's yeah. the mental exercise. Yeah. It's not yeah. output. So I'm good. No, th this is loss in TFP, not the loss what in output. TFP? What? TFP is total zero production. Yeah, it's no, this. No. Yeah. No. Well, yeah, to get to yeah, it's it's this. Uh, the so. Um, in the, well, you can divide y by um, by total k and then l, and and to recover the loss in y, then you need to multiply back the the k and the l. Well, by by well, what's the definition of TIP? The definition of TIP is output divided by the uh, the so capital and labor. Output divided by what? By capital and labor. Um, yeah. So it's normal. Yeah. It's a new formula. The new the well, this is at the firm level. So the, the, the TIP is the aggregate TIP, which is once you've done the, the aggregation divided by aggregate labor. And yeah, per unit of, yeah, per unit of, yeah. Yeah. So then you can translate it back to the loss in output by, by multiplying back the, the inputs. Um, yes? Uh, so I'm wondering how much the number is uh, uh, dependent on the structure of the reduced Right. For example, have you tried with a time varying parameter or with a um, model that takes into, uh, into account the limited the variance? Um, so we've done, we're yeah. doing versions yeah. where you take into account adjustment cost. Yeah, we don't find huge uh, impact of adjustment cost. And then you can also yeah. further ask, what if you also have financial frictions? Um, and then depending on the form of financial frictions, they may have different impact. And therefore, as I mentioned before, the, the overall impact is model dependent, depends on what are the frictions that you embed. Um, so in our setting, we haven't found that the, the observed um, adjustment, the adjustment cost, if you add an element of adjustment cost, uh, 
it doesn't seem to have um, a big impact. But if you add other types of frictions, like financial frictions, um, you might be financial frictions themselves will lead to misallocation to begin with. And then um, you can see whether they would amplify um, misallocations because of misperception. Of so what you're saying is that yeah. we know that there's much more, the different countries have different misallocations. Yeah. Now, the, li the literature until now has been emphasizing things like, you know, the legal system right. or taxes yeah. or whatever. Or, yeah. you know, so in a country like Brazil, we have a lot of informal firms. And right. Informal firms have a lot of, they have too much, too much capital go to small firms. Yeah. Why? Because they don't pay tax. Yeah. So we have too much capital and too much labor in small firms. That's the problem. Because they don't pay tax. And now you're telling me that some of that is coming from expectations. Potentially. But it's a mi much higher frequency phenomenon in a sense, right? Um, it, well, or again, it depends on how you model expectations. expectations. So, yeah. I mean, you're measuring this thing in kind of higher frequency data. That's what I'm saying. Well, it's annual. Annual. Yeah. So if you want to explain... Yeah, because we think of Brazil having yeah. uh, low TFP. Yeah. It being a result of something that hasn't changed in 50 years. Right. That's how we measure it. Yeah, that. yeah. But when you think about, about uh, what you're telling me, on, on top of that, this kind of relatively high, annual, it's relatively high frequency. Yeah, for, yeah. The laws haven't changed in yeah. 50 years. But, uh, uh -huh. right? Uh, that can also contribute. Yeah. So what's, when you, you, you probably don't, remember the number, people have to figure out how much loss you need to leave relative to the U.S. because you know for every, does it? Yeah. Does it, does it, does yeah, like Cian Clino is like Clino, U.S. Yeah. versus yeah. India. And then I, I think that's a no. number. Well, they have a much large number, although there are also like debates about the Cian Clino interpretation or measure, measurement as, as well. Yeah, so it's... Uh, um, I'm sure there'll be debates about these two. Yeah, I think that it's like something like ten times as large, something like that. But um, I right, but I don't remember the exact level. However, just note that if you trust the intuition of these formula, some of the mechanisms captured by this formula, your point about cross-sectional variation is quite interesting. For example, we already see cross-sectional variations from U.S. versus Italy. Um, so because Italy is the Italian environment is, is here is because it has more volatility. So if you have a country with a lot of volatility, there's a lot of scope for mistakes. If you have a country that is very stable, then you don't have that much scope so for. Um, that help. Things have not changed a lot in Brazil. Yeah. This well, debating this problem with them, which is not 50 years of course, right. 20 years, whatever. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. That is the help. The other yeah. Side. But I understand. It's, it's yeah. It's uh, in the environments, either for countries or for time periods where you have scope for large displacement, right. um, like the tech boom and so on, then by the, the way these models are specified for the same level of bias, you have much more scope to get things wrong. Right. Um, any other questions? I'm surprised yeah. by how low it is. Yeah, well, so we've been pretty. <laughs> It's sort of surprise as well. Um, so the that's just one source of distortion. Yeah, it's that's one scary. source of distortion. But sorry, I think the row. Yeah, the they are estimated. The row is well. The, the estimation of row is pretty tricky because of sample bias, which is I will discuss later. But I think roughly on the, the level of 0.85 to 0.9 on an annual basis, uh, that's in the in the ballpark. Um, of rho and lambda and gamma, as I mentioned, the uh, the um, typically the estimates in pretty different settings is from so point. I mean, I mean lambda and gamma. So not rho. Yeah. I, so it, the lambda and gamma distance. here is I think it's roughly uh, so for the U.S. it's about um, point two and for Italy point three ish. Um, but we just, we're still settling on the numbers. Uh, the typical so estimate. One that is yeah. lambda yeah. times yeah. sigma, right? You yeah. cannot identify those things separately. I don't know why the model is written like this. Yeah. Because you're not going and you can see from your formula, yeah. you, don't identif you don't need to identify the lambda and the volatility of. of right, of you of don't have to. Five. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to. Initially, yeah. we didn't. Yeah. Well, you. You can, you can technically, but I, I should How? have some backup slides uh, on this. So this is 
this is identified off of, uh, well, sorry, this is identified off of regressing the TFP residual on the forecast error, which the, the forecast error has error that comes from both components, and that the TFP uh, residual would mostly, the TFP residual from the perspective of econometrician has more of the, okay, yeah, Whatever. yeah. It yeah, it doesn't really matter, the and yeah, the, the composite right? effect, yeah, yeah, sigma. yeah, so and uh, operationally it doesn't, yeah, yeah, yeah. operationally it doesn't really matter, huh? Op operationally it doesn't really matter, this is more, remember, of it's the way you said it, it's rather than one, it's one plus lambda, that's really the comparison, right, yes, so one becomes 1.2, that's what you said, the effect yeah. of that is that, yeah. so instead of being one, it's 1.2, yes, yeah. that's and correct, so, so it has a meaning, even regardless of what sigma is. No, because no, you, can, no. you can reuse her, her, her formula. Jose for just said it like if you model the. Well, the you just think that psi, yeah. okay, is really. There's a psi tilde which is 1 plus lambda times psi. Yeah. You don't see psi. Psi is private information. So you might as well claim that you. See Whatever you infer, you infer about psi tilde or about psi. That's what I don't believe you can see. You don't have observation right. of psi. So what Jose was saying, like you have a TFP process that looks like this. You can estimate, like you can estimate TFP process and whether you decompose the residual into two components versus you just put the yeah. residual as one. Um, it, it doesn't really matter. And we do this more or well, less for general generality, but you don't have to do this decomposition. It, both yeah, quantitatively it's, it's and important. operationally, it doesn't really uh, make a big it's, difference. It's very interesting that you can do this and you can get that from. So, so what is it about the Italian economy that makes lambda and gamma bigger than in the US? Um, well, so it's connected in some sense to the previous question, which is, if you see variations in the degree of bias, are there demographic predictors of the degree of bias? Yeah. Um, so, so, so what specifically? So then, then I need to conjecture somewhat. So what? Um, I think that's to some extent empirically testable question. We can do more sample cuts mm -hmm. um, in the Italian data as well as in the U.S. data and to understand whether the estimated uh, bias varies by firm characteristic. Um, Nick Bloom has had a pretty interesting line of work that studies managerial quality and how much planning a firm does. And he, at least in the US data, he does find that there's pretty, pretty wide dispersion in terms of how much planning data collection uh, and processing firms do, and uh, firms with higher managerial quality do more of it. So if a firm um, collects more data and analyzes data much more systematically, it may have less bias. Mm -hmm. um, whether there is an industry effect, I don't think we have looked at it yet. We could. Um, in some industries, operation may be much more challenging than other industries, mm -hmm. and we can look at whether that's the case um, uh, that that has any impact as well. Um, do you think public yeah. data or might might be better in the U.S. and, and, and that could be a source of you know, difference? Yeah. Data is uh, noisy. So yeah. data is probably noisier in Italy, both at the aggregate, both at the individual level and yeah. also at the aggregate level yeah. when you collect it. So, so I, I think that goes both both effects go in the same direction. If I extrapolate based on, for example, the Bloom <coughs> the type of work, then um, you may think that. U.S. firms have more, have higher managerial quality. They collect more data, process more data. Uh, Italian firms but less. Public data in the U.S. has not to be very good, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Public data in the U.S. has right. not to be very good. But relative but to but Italy, but compared to Italy. Italy. I don't even okay. know relative to Italy. No. But I, I see relative to Brazil, for instance, no. which is a country, you know, where there's a lot of things are very messy, but there's a lot of public data that the United States doesn't exist because privacy issues and things mm -hmm. like that. Governments are more, more reluctant in the U.S. to publish or, you know, so it's not really clear the public data. You know, private data for sure is better in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Public data, I'm not so sure. Maybe it is relative. 
Yeah, but that, that's exactly a great, so those are great questions. Maybe privacy issues means that if you have it, it's very noisy. <coughs> Think about it. That's, that's an, if there are privacy issues, means that if you, even if you have it, then it's probably noisy. But you have some, you know, like in Finland, you know, everybody's income at the end of the year. You can't know that in the U.S. That's a lot of public information. Because you know what everybody, income tax declaration, you know, how much they Mm, yeah, but th those are great questions. It's it's still very much work in progress, so that a lot more. Um, All work. the first three yeah. terms, we assume they're the same across countries, right? Yes, in true. Yes, Th that's why. So all the variations are coming for the last. Two. Right. Yes. Which tell you where where the source is, where Italy should. Be. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, that's a good point. So, like, it's it's not clear whether the production function in the US and in Italy are necessarily the same, and, but that's really hard to measure very right. well, so, so we shut down that channel. Yeah. shut down that thing. That's yeah. So all the variations are coming from your estimates of... From the, the, the volatility and the, the row and... The yeah, yeah. The yeah. There's a difference between the Italian economy and the American economy, uh -huh. which, which, which doesn't play in your mind. That is that the Italian, there's a much heavier regulation so yes. The ability of a firm yeah. to adjust, yes. for instance, to fire workers. Right, that's a great point, to, yes. You know, is more limited. Uh huh. And yeah, but that's presumably what's being measured on the secular stuff. That right. People who work on this and looking exactly at that. So that, yes. that is not reflected. But I think, I think what Al Hanan says is, so for example, you know, if you. you want to change right, if you're over optimistic, then what's the scope for acting on that? Opt over uh, just but like what you said in, in the yeah that you will expect a lower a lower number there so that in fact enhances yeah. 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 you have you have your uh, mistake is more constrained yeah. because when you yeah. you can't respond to changes I mean well, it's yeah. costly well, to respond to yeah, right. yeah but then it's also costly to act on your biases It's a much more uh, bureaucratic, and I start saying no, but it puts much more restrictions but on. But then may avoid the firing. Right. So actually, that you can see whether by uh, um, uh, modeling different adjustment cost um, in Italy and the U.S., whether that can. Um, Okay, you can Some go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but no, th those are really great comments, and yeah, it's very so uh, much work in progress, so we, d we do need to think about many of these issues. Um, the one final theme I want to mention in thinking about the impact of bias beliefs, and this very much tries to connect to what Ben was mentioning yesterday, is um, there is interesting um, phenomenon if you combine bias beliefs with imperfect information. And here I will discuss a case with uh, where heterogeneous and noisy information just arises exogenously, um, like in Woodford 2003, not because of in endogenous acquisition, but already you see some of the mechanisms that will change your interpretation of some relationships when, once you um, incorporate the coexistence of biased beliefs and imperfect information. So as I mentioned in the first slide, one way for detecting uh, biases in, in forecasts is to see whether forecast revisions um, can predict forecast errors. Um, and as I mentioned, if you do it at the, um, in, uh, in, in with aggregate uh, forecasts, which is consensus average forecast, um, you generally see that forecast revisions positively predict forecast errors. When the consensus forecast moves up, that tends to predict that future consensus forecast is lower than uh, than realization. Mm -hmm. However, when you do it at the individual level, you often see that when people um, uh, 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 revise up, they tend to overshoot and therefore future um, realizations tend to be uh, lower, so this coefficient is negative instead. And then there's a question which is how to reconcile the two, um, how to reconcile different features that we see in individual level data and consensus data. Um, so here I will just show one framework for thinking about the coexistence of biased beliefs with uh, imperfect information, just building off of the simple diagnostic expectations that uh, 
we discussed in the first lecture. Um, so suppose that the data generative process is, again, very simple. It's an AR1 process, um, but each forecaster receives a noisy signal of the fundamental. It doesn't have to be literally that people will see different things. It could be that people have different interpretations of, different, uh, of the same thing. And so uh, this uh, component may capture either imperfect attention to the uh, information or, or truly different information or just different interpretation of the same information. And then um, in this case, you can do, uh, you can do the, the forecast, uh, the, the updating exercise um, in a la uh, a Kalman filter. So the distorted Kalman filter will just be the regular Kalman filter once you see the signal uh, multiplied by the Kalman gain instead of the regular Kalman gain. The Kalman gain is inflated um, to the proportion one plus theta. So this is very much the same as what you saw of diagnostic expectations in general. The subjective belief is the objective belief plus theta multiplied by um, the, 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 inform the, the new information. So in this case, we know that in, in, at the individual level, the forecasting rule is this. So you see your own signal, you um, updated it too much by a fraction one plus theta. And then you can derive, if we live in this type of world, um, you take the consensus forecast, which is you take the average of these things, um, and you can see what's the uh, regression coefficient of forecast errors and forecast revisions. It turns out that for the consensus level, the covariance between forecast error and forecast revision divided by the variance of forecast revision is proportional um, to uh, this object, which is which measure trace off how noisy the signals are, which, or how different the interpretations people have of the same signal relative to how large the fundamental shock is. And again, you see that overreaction is typically scaled by the, the, the size of the, the variance of the fundamental shocks. So if you live in a world where there's a lot of noise relative to the fundamental shock and overreaction, then you can actually get a positive consensus coefficient, meaning just each individual reacts to, overreacts to his or her own private information, but I don't know other people's interpretation of the same, um, of the, the, their signal, and therefore I effectively underreact to their idiosyncratic uh, interpretation of their signal. And when you average things up, it may look as if our average um, forecast um, underreacts to the average information set just because the information sets are not overlapping. However, at the individual level, you would see what uh, we see at the individual level. Each person overreacts to, um, uh, to his or her own information. So in this case, it says that when people have heterogeneous information um, for a variety of reasons, then individual level um, biases, when you aggregate them up, it, it depends really on how you aggregate. Uh, one way is to aggregate beliefs, and therefore you can see these differences when you directly aggregate beliefs. Another way is to aggregate actions instead, like what we saw uh, in the previous case. If you write a model where actions are just a linear function of beliefs, and the, the aggregate actions would carry over the features of the aggregation of beliefs, However, you can, there are many models where the aggregation of actions, like including the one we saw just now, is not a, just a linear function of uh, linearly aggregates beliefs. And in those cases, um, when you think about the consequences of biased beliefs, it, it does make a difference whether you think about aggregating actions versus aggregating beliefs. And perhaps it's uh, um, for, for purposes of evaluating their consequences, it's more important to aggregate actions for the purpose of understanding features of information sets, it may still deliver you interesting insights when you aggregate uh, beliefs. Yeah. It's just because other people's information are not in your information set and therefore you don't update with respect. So suppose 
person J receives a signal that doesn't enter into your updating equation. You yes. Of course, you only update with respect to the signal that you have. But you don't see the signal. Yeah, yeah. So I don't see your signal. I don't see your interpretation of your signal. Therefore, my updating doesn't have it a component of your signal. Suppose that I can see your signal, and therefore there is a component where I update with respect to your signal, then I, I would overreact to your signal as well. There's no such component, and therefore I effectively interreact to your signal. Um, now I want to um, end with a summary of some of the open questions that um, we've discussed throughout um, today. Um, one is, as um, we uh, discussed at the end of the first lecture, when you start thinking about applying bias expectations, there's a question of what's the space? Um, do you model fundamentals, output, prices, and returns? And for example, as we saw, if you just apply bias expectations to fundamentals, you don't get necessarily extrapolation of returns per se. Um, and there are models that directly work off of extrapolations of returns. Um, so it's, uh, it depends on the application that you're interested in and the key tension that you think exists in the data for thinking about at what level we model um, the distortions and expectations. And um, another uh, thing related to it, which is we saw in the very simple illustrative example, we see um, these things can be linked, especially when, you, when people exist in an equilibrium, meaning that people, ex people typically observe the same price. And therefore, when you have different expectations of future cash flows, obviously that would translate into different expectations of returns as well. So whether you interpret the evidence with some equilibrium concept in mind versus uh, in unconditionally, that can also uh, make a difference. And um, as we also discussed during the talk and also during the break, there's a lot of open questions about heterogeneity and disagreement. So m most of what I've said characterizes biases of beliefs on average. Um, it doesn't r capture directly um, disagreement other than this like very uh, straightforward way. If you really assume that people have different information, then of course you get disagreement. Um, but there's a question which is whether people disagreement uh, all comes from different information set or disagreement may also arise even when have similar information set because of pre different um, backgrounds that they have. And so one feature of the data both in field data and experiment data is there is a lot of dispersion and a lot of disagreement. Um, what generates those disagreement and how to characterize them where they arise from is um, a question that I think um, the literature has not fully explored yet. And then we also talked about elements that's related to belief about central tendencies, which is what 90% of the work has been based on, versus belief of tales, which is very, has very limited empirical evidence because most of the expectations data um, are about central tendencies. But beliefs in, about tales can be quite important, for example, for thinking about things like uh, credit cycles and tech booms. Tech booms are much more associated with beliefs about the upper tail. Credit cycles are much more associated uh, with beliefs about the downside. Uh, what characterizes the features of these beliefs? What are the, uh, if they have deviations from some frictionless benchmark, what characterizes those deviations? We don't fully know this yet. And finally, as I also mentioned in response to Alhana's questions and some several other questions. Um, so we have, for example, models to characterize biased expectations. But are we thinking about applying the model the same way to firm managers, stock markets, and credit cycles? That's an also another question one needs to think about in practice. Um, is there any interaction between biased beliefs and uh, the, the underlying settings and financial structure? Um, that's um, an interesting question. So if you only allow people to finance things based on equity or based on debt uh, or a mixture of different securities, does the same type of belief biases have um, a different uh, impact for real outcomes? That's something that I think has not been really explored. Maybe, um, maybe the biases yeah. themselves depend on the financial structure. Right, yeah. So that's some of the question that people 
have conjectured in the context of uh, house prices. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, me and Sufi tend to have the view that um, credit, uh, credit will amplify some form of bias and beliefs. It allows you to finance easily and then trade and, um, and therefore um, when you st and, and contribute more to rises in house prices. And when you have large rises in house prices, that can further sh shift to beliefs. Um, so there can be potential feedback loops, but I don't think I'm aware of any work that addresses those questions. Yeah, and also Eric's question at the beginning, which is uh, when you start uh, disseminating information about other people's beliefs, then how, whether that contributes to any, yeah, yeah, yeah. But as you see in those cases, it also matters whether you interpret those beliefs as indications of fundamental TFP shocks or some other higher level outcomes that, that could make a difference as well. somewhat but linked to your question because very I yeah. understand that the public people are not not subject to the biases here right. that they are here and so on, but you can in fact think of public information whether whether some but they ask the question, if something becomes public, what does that do to the to the to the equilibrium? And here so you could perhaps think of that mixing that literature what with what you were doing. Yeah. Somebody was quite curious. Yeah, for the Yeah, so there are some things that we know. There are many things that we don't know, and that's wh uh, what makes it exciting to talk about this in a summer school. Um, and I just want to briefly spend ten minutes mentioning the data. If some of you are interested in studying various questions, so it gives you a sense of where to find data about what. Um, if you are interested in, for example, things related to firms and earnings. Um, the, uh, the very rich set of data collected by um, the Duke CFO surveys since 1990s um, is really a great resource. So this is firm's forecast of next 12-month uh, outcomes, um, including earnings, sales, investment, employment, wage, productivity, price, S&P 500 returns. Um, they can release aggregate yeah, data. Also when the C CFO's fired? Uh, to no. Correct, to correct, uh, then to look at the forecast and whether, for how long has been CFO? <laughs> yes. So unfortunately, they, they can know it, but they cannot publish it. So they, they, by their contract with the participants, they cannot disclose the identity of each contributor. So they can only publish um, on their website the aggregate and sector level data. Um, but they, it's already a lot of data for I think several major sectors and, and the aggregate. Uh, they started doing this in the US and now they've extended this to Europe, Asia as well. So it's, it's really um, a very um, uh, helpful um, effort. And I so will say it's good that they started in 1998 because a lot of the test of rationality really relies on large, long time dimension. If you have a quarter, you cannot do it. Um, and then there's for other earnings forecasts, there's a, uh, the analyst earnings forecast has been very widely used. This is even longer uh, time series since 1980s. Um, um, so of near-term earnings as well as long-term earnings growth, mainly earnings and sales. So for this, you can see what firm is about, what is the analyst, how long the analyst has been around. Um, so this you can... Those um, are analyst forecasts. So, yeah, so these are analyst Just forecasts. There's a supplement to it, which is firms forecast that firms have publicly released. So there's definitely selection into it. Uh, the guidance selects large firms you, much you more. Correlate those two. I mean, you know the same. Pretty firm high correlated. Too. Yes. No, yeah. you can know the same firm. In yeah. And, and, and both, yeah, so they, they are pretty same. correlated. And in previous that work that we've done with uh, John Graham and Cam Harvey, where we send code to their RA to process the firm level information, you actually see that there is pretty substantial correlation across all these sources. Uh, but it's, it's a really big hassle to use the individual level data for them. But you can trust that on average, um, the publicly available information captures most of the, um, the features of this much richer private information as well. Um, and then if you are interested in stock market, financial market sentiment, um, there is uh, some typically used data, for example, a survey of American 
um, Association of Individual Investors also very nicely, very long time series since the 1980s also had pretty high frequencies on a, we, uh, on a weekly basis. Um, unfortunately for this, you only have the aggregate data, so you cannot really study individual level um, behavior. It belongs to that association. I mean, who is the very uh, by sample, self-selected sample? It, so you can sign up um, to Anybody the association? To yeah, any, yeah. <coughs> anyone can uh, s sign up. And it's typically like people who are very engaged in trading who uh, are their members. But uh, it would be much better if we have more demographic information of this um, data, but I don't think it, it, they release it. Um, for the... If I'm an investor, yeah. do, I, do I want other investors to know uh, whether I'm uh, optimistic or pessimistic about Yeah, you do. After you buy. Yes. <laughs> After you take the position. No, no. If you hear an analyst in CNBC say Apple stock is going to go up, all you can conclude is that they're Apple stock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all you can conclude. Presumably because they're optimist about it, but, but, but why should they, what, what is their incentive to reveal this? So that people, because other people. They, they're hoping, a lot of people think they're a genius and go out and buy Apple stock, at which time they'll be able to sell it at a higher price. All those analysts, you know, they always have conflict of interest, which yeah. is a big problem. They wouldn't tell their stuff they're holding is going to go up in price. That's all you can, that's why when you see an analyst on TV, that's all you can do. And that they're holding the stuff. Presumably but the same thing. Yeah. Well, these people would, uh, yeah, certainly, yes. So well, the, yeah. yeah. So you're, you're, yeah. You're, you can infer their stockholders. Yeah, but uh, you, that's one of those things where you don't really know how much it matters because there are thousands of them. So the yeah, so the, the yeah, the marginal contribution of your input is... Yeah. 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 I mean, is that information ma made public or only the members of the association get it? You, you can... Mean, the, the survey of what everybody else in the association thinks. Yeah. Is it available only to the members, or is it immediately well, made public? I think you need to researchers. Yeah, right? yeah, it's no, publicly exposed, available. No, I mean, I mean, no, real time. It, real time. No. That, so they publish it every week. It's a different thing. They publish it every week, um, so you can so see. Do I have an advantage being in an association? Do I see it a, a day before everybody uh, about probably people? not probably in association? It's probably true. Most organizations that I don't know for a fact. I think I signed up, and I don't think I don't get, get any. Then it's hard to explain why. <laughs> so why, why do exactly? So, so yeah, well, what does it represent, uh, the things that are there? Yeah. Well, I think you do need to sign up to receive the information, but you don't necessarily receive it earlier than others. So it's just like uh, convenience, like, yeah. But well, why do you sign up for the AEA? Well, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, then uh, also the Gallup survey, this is uh, part of the Gallup effort, although they've um, they have some gaps in this collection, but roughly with all these data, you see pretty similar um, overall. Um, the the first uh, principal component it explains a lot of these movements across all these surveys. Schiller has been collecting um, a stock market confidence index, and that that's publicly available through Yale since two th early 2000. Uh, Rand American Life Panel. Uh, asks us a richer set of questions, and also not just the mean forecast, but also in different bins. But that's a much more recent survey since 2008. And then you have the classic uh, Michigan survey of consumers and the more recent New York sur survey of uh, consumer expectations. You have the classic survey of professional forecasters published by the Philadelphia Fed, where you have information for both each forecaster and the aggregate. It's anonymous uh, on a quarterly basis for many variables since the late 60s, for um, the rest since the 80s. So again, pretty long time series. Um, and then you can also um, purchase blue chip survey. Um, by and large, the, the blue chip survey and survey of professional forecasters for variables where they overlap are pretty similar, but the blue chip survey covers a lot more financial market outcomes like uh, forecasts of bond yields that the survey of professional forecasters don't. Um, cover. Many people have asked about uh, exchange rate uh, forecasts. Um, these are much more sporadic and there is a data source called Consensus Economics that collected 
systematically, but they're enormously expensive. So exchange rate forecast is not easy to get. Um, so w with there, it, yeah. Sorry, is there any data of any of those surveys, yeah. forecast versus realization? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, most of this you can construct realizations. So this you can, at the firm level, they can, uh, but all, uh, on the aggregate you can compare the average forecast with over aggregate um, earnings. These two, you of course, can. You have the firm identifier, so you can do the analysis of predictable forecast errors. Uh, these surveys are qu mostly quantitative, so it's hard to assess uh, the qualitative accuracy, but as we mentioned in the first talk, sometimes they're just directionally different from what models would predict. So that is a sign that, that okay. the people, yeah. Can you see a consistent bias? Because that yeah. would be like you are aligned yeah. so with you, 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 you can see consistent bias in this that we uh, discover, di discuss various ways to assess it in the, in the first talk. And for these, yes, you, we do use these data extensively to assess systematic biases because you can link it to realizations. Uh, one uh, cautionary tale is for macro forecasts, they, um, the like GDP numbers are updated uh, over time. So to correspond to what these forecasters can see in real time, it's, it's better to use real time GDP data, uh, which for the US is available through um, Philadelphia Fed and for Europe it's uh, available through ECB and Europe also has the European level uh, counterpart of survey of professional forecasters um, starting from early 2000s for Eurozone level inflation and unemployment uh, much fewer outcomes but they do much a much richer set of horizons uh, mu and much longer horizons this is mostly horizon up to five quarters out the European surveys do horizons up to five and ten years out Sorry? Thompson Reuters yeah. collects all these predictions, and if they, if, uh, they systematically uh, check what's your precision, and if you are more precise than the others, it gives your prediction a higher value. Okay, great, thanks. Bloomberg also collects yes. forecasts as well, and uh, it's, it's in, in, unless these that are updated at a fixed point in time, so this is at the, the end of every month, the survey of professional forecasters in the middle of every quarter. Bloomberg is updated more continuously. Um, and oftentimes, Bloomberg data is used to construct macro surprises, which is you look at the Bloomberg forecast before a macro announcement and the actual value of the macro announcement to construct um, surprises. So with the data, I want to also mention a, a few uh, cautionary tales in, uh, testing um, deviations from rational expectations. One is, as we saw in the, in the data, some of them do start pretty early, so you have a large number um, of observations along a time dimension. It, you, you cannot test deviations from rational expectations with large n, a large cross-section, and short t. In the most extreme case, if you have one cross-section, and people are forecasting the same outcome, then of course people who say it's high will have a relatively low realization. People who say something low will have a relatively high realization. That form of predictable forecast error doesn't really tell you anything. Um, the ability to understand features in predictable forecast errors really comes from a large time dimension. And then there is a, a often encountered issue in this context and in other contexts, which is uh, uh, Kendall, Stambaugh, Nicol bias, they all come from the same source, which is when you have a persistent variable, it's not easy to estimate the persistence in sample with finite sample. If you have asymptotically, there's no bias, but in finite sample, you can have a bias. The simple intuition just comes from it's supposed you want to estimate an AR1 process, um, because in a finite sample, you cannot estimate the mean very well. So that translates into a potential bias in the estimation of persistence, um, which is downward biased. So like if you have a random walk, then in a, in a finite sample, you may not be able to really detect the, that it's a random walk because you don't really know, um, or something close, persistent, very persistent, you may not know whether it's very persistent. It tends to be downward biased. And that translates into all the predictable, reg predictive regressions to the extent 
that the predictor variable that you are trying to use, the z, is correlated uh, with the, the with x, where their innovations are correlated. So if z is 0.6 percent, uh, like 60% innovations in Z is 60% correlated with innovations in X, then you inherit 60% of this bias. So uh, whenever you want to, est to predict uh, Z, to use Z to predict X, you need to think about it, whether you have long enough T, and if you don't have long enough T, uh, whether the bias may be affected by the finite sample um, uh, issues. And of course, when you run forecasting regressions, like, because forecast errors, the underlying forecast errors are often autocorrelated, especially with overlapping samples. If you use anything to predict forecast errors, to the extent that predictable variables innovation is correlated with the innovation in the forecast um, error, you need to be aware of this bias. And then finally, as we already mentioned, um, one may need to be um, careful in interpreting tests using average beliefs, in particular whether you're trying to predict errors in average beliefs using information that's plausibly in everyone's information set or using information that's not necessarily in everyone's information set. That will uh, have some impact in how you interpret the potential bias that you detect. And that also connects to the question with yesterday, which is um, if people do end up collecting different information, then is there a way to nest uh, the, the information collection process and the biases conditioning on the information that it process? Most of the biases we talked about today is biases conditioning on the information that you do process. So overall, I think well, over the past uh, many years and with the effort of many research papers, uh, we, we've learned that there is substantial information from the data on expectations for both helping us understand the structure of the beliefs and the impact of beliefs on decisions. Of course, as we see, there's a lot of more um, work to try to understand the, the impact of biased beliefs in different settings. What does it depend on? How to isolate the impact of the bias component as opposed to the overall um, expectations. So um, taking into account bias, potentially systematic biases and beliefs in the way people respond to information, uh, in the way people think about persistence of um, economic variables can also open up new venues for understanding economic activities. Many of the, the research work here is motivated by trying to understand credit cycles, financial crisis, and misallocation. So this opens up a, a very interesting um, uh, set of mechanisms that one can explore. And over, an overarching theme, which Ben also mentioned yesterday, is we ultimately do want to see if there's potential unification for connecting biases in expectations or biases in information collection with biases, behavioral biases in general. In the particular context of expectations formation, there is um, a lot of uh, uh, hope to try to understand whether the biases we see in expectations like extrapolation as opposed to modeling it in ad hoc fashion, um, whether we can connect it to other types of representative heuristics, availability heuristics, the potential role of memory and perception in having some overarching connection of, um, of judgment and belief formation in different contexts, not just that we have developed some context-specific models for dealing with some particular form of expectations. Of course, unification may take some time, and, but it's, um, it's, it's a pursuit that hopefully uh, will uh, take us somewhere. And uh, so there, as you see, many friends to make progress and I hope after you get some rest after the summer school, you will start thinking about interesting research questions based on the presentations that you have seen here. Um, so that's the second part of my talk. Do you, you have any questions for what we have discussed? Okay, Thank so do not much. extrapolate when you travel back to so find the right <laughs> gate, uh, find the right time of plane departure, and have a smooth bed trip back home.